to our panelists uh, today, our distinguished panelists today, uh, the moderator for the day, uh, the Young Lawyers Committee that has uh, put this together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen that have taken time to join this webinar, good afternoon. My name is David Sigano from the East Africa Law Society and I take this opportunity on behalf uh, of the Governing Council of the Society and the Secretariat uh, to welcome you to this Young Lawyers mentorship, uh, mentorship Session where we have put together a distinguished team of panelists to guide our young team of upcoming lawyers on how best to take care of the clients they get, especially 21st century clients who have different needs from probably the traditional clients we're used to, how they can handle their needs, how they can retain them, and how they can grow their practice. Uh, to moderate our session today, we have uh, a, a young lawyer that has already established himself. He's a senior partner at Diadem Advocates in Uganda. He will guide the conversation. He will moderate and lead us through uh, the entire session today. I welcome you, Philip, to take it on from here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, to the members who are logged in, uh, this is about, I think, the it's one of the many webinars that we have had engagements with young lawyers. I think we started with uh, a young lawyer being at the crossroads. You are employed in a law firm. You want to opt out, but you don't know what to do. You have started your practice, but you don't know whether to step, specialize or go with the mainstream practice. So along the way, we've, we've covered so many things like farm management and all others. Today, we want to look at client management because the side of the world where I am, you open up a law firm, you have a few files, some files you come with them from the, your former employer, uh, some, some files, they have been yours. In a way, you have a client or two. So you decide to open up shop. Uh, today, we want to know, how do you manage? Uh, what, is the, what, is the, what is the driving force? Is it a vision that is that you're starting your farm to outlive you? Is it the vision that you're starting your farm to be the biggest on the land? Or is it something you're doing to take home bread? Our panelists, uh, I'll start with Nelson. Nelson, his tagline is money never sleeps. Nelson, for all I know, about 12 years ago, he would walk into a restaurant in Nairobi, in Juguna restaurant, with his file, pen, and laptop, handle clients one by one. Today, he, he has the big, one of the biggest funds. I think the last count, I, I think, was about 18 from associate to, from partner to associate level, 18 advocates. Uh, the last I also knew he had opened up uh, a satellite branch. So Nelson has the experience required. He moved from the street to an office. Today he has established even satellite offices to do his practice. Uh, you're welcome, Nelson. Uh, Thank you, Philip. Our, Thank you very much. Our second panelist is... Uh, Fiona, Fiona Magona, Fiona Magona. Uh, one thing I know about her, she writes, she shares knowledge. She, she's, she's a partner at Max Advocates. Uh, she has over 17 years experience, if not 18 this year. Uh, she has handled clientele. She has advised on corporate transactions. She has a vast experience. Uh, you're welcome, Fiona. Thank you so much. Philip. thank you. You're welcome. I've actually, I actually, I always follow your your sessions. Your grateful. Yeah. Uh, then we have Julien Kavaruganda. Uh, Julien Kavaruganda. The little I know is uh, he also runs one of the biggest farms in East Africa. He is, uh, 
he must be chairman, if I remember well, of the East African Arbitration Center. Uh, he runs, he runs a sort of modern practice where it is not so legal, but legal. Uh, Julian will be speaking to young arbitrators still on the 15th, if I'm not mistaken, because I've already registered for that uh, on the 16th of June. He will be speaking to young arbitrators. The three of them, I think, have an experience of about 55 years in practice. They have opened farms, they have worked in farms, they have built farms from zero to where they are. The young lawyers, advocates of East Africa need to know from you people. I'll start with Nelson because you're a business development, business development and strategy partner. That's right. Yeah. I'll start with you. What is the underlying factor that makes uh, a nonprofit sure. move from where he is to where you are? I'll share with members, you started your practice in a restaurant. That one you have confessed several times. It was in a restaurant and having borrowed some money from your mother. So we need to know, how have you driven your practice from that restaurant to being one of the leading firms in Africa today? We need truth. It's hard talk. Yeah. We don't want you to tell us, brand yourselves, do this. Yeah. No, we need yeah. to know. Yeah. Philip, thank you for the opportunity to come and share um, my learning so far. I think life is a continuous journey of learning. Um, there is uh, a phrase I've been uh, reflecting on called snowball, the snowball effect. And uh, essentially, it means that uh, small actions have um, this cap 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 capacity of growing and, and, and increasing in momentum and in size to a significant size. So if, if you were to ask me when was my biggest breakthrough, I'll tell you I'm also waiting for it because it's been small incremental steps that get you to build that um, momentum that then, you know, when people look and they say, you know, this is significant, but you know that it's been gradual small steps. Huh? Um, so what I would say is that uh, two things have been key to those towards that you know, a snowball effect. It's uh, technical excellence and relationships. For me, those two would be the crux of it. You know, if you were to tell me what's your secret recipe, I'll tell you, um, you know, no one starts with perfection in technical excellence, um, but it is something that you gradually expose yourself and commit yourself to, and it keeps getting better. But hand uh, side by side with that, you need to have um, a determination to grow your relationships. And so what I would say is that, um, you know, relationships are everywhere, you know, from, uh, um, from your gym, your neighborhood, you know, your church, um, you know, your, your, uh, your, your, your social club, you know, so just grow your relationships, um, you know, intentionally. Um, for instance, I'm representing uh, my neighbors um, in a suit that is going all the way to the Court of Appeal. And uh, it was just by me attending, um, attending a, a neighborhood meeting. And through that, then you offer your, your, your support, you offer solutions, you offer suggestions, and uh, those people around you, not because you want a brief, but just because you're being helpful. And, and down the road, then, you know, um, the, the, the members say, you know, the residents say, you know, you are the right person to present us on this. And, and through that, then, you know, uh, that, kept, that, that, that case has uh, made a constitutional, um, uh, a constitutional fast because it's, it's granted 
constitutional rights in a commercial contract. And, and it was just basic that a basic situation where um, the developer did not provide a playing field for our children. And so because it was not in the lease, but it was in the marketing material, then we went to court arguing that the constitutional rights of children to play. And then there was an aspect of water and we're saying the right to clean water. And that has become a constitutional case that has uh, been, uh, uh, it has sort of become uh, uh, a fast in, in Kenya. And so, you know, when I think about the uh, number of briefs I've handled for um, the members of uh, my church, you know, members from uh, um, my, uh, my, 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 my social club, um, I would say relationships are so key, but not just relationships of external professionals, relationships also with professional colleagues. Um, you know, I think about the young colleagues that have supported my business. Um, you know, a young lawyer who, you know, I, I, you know, we came and did pupillage with us. Um, a young lawyer who I've been mentoring. Yesterday, a young lawyer who I mentored. Many years back, I'd forgotten even who, where, what I did for him. He called me for breakfast and told me, you know, I'm going to give you this brief because of what you did for me in campus 18 years ago. You know, I, and he told me, I, I won't even tell you what you did for me, but it is because of that that I'm giving you this work. And so what I'll tell you, Philip, and uh, you know, our colleagues on the on the call, that my own experience and learning has been relationships are so significant, so important. Your social capital is what really makes uh, or or, um, or or destroys you. Um, and, and, and so it is very important how you treat people, how you treat your, your peers, your seniors, your juniors, how you treat your clients as well. And, um, you know, in part of talking about the snowball effect, it's how you handle one matter. And then now that matter opens a door for the next and the next. And so my, my thinking is that um, it is easier to market to an existing client than to go out there and, and, and uh, try and market to a client who has not had an opportunity to, to receive your service. So, you know, Philip, if I was to tell you that you're, since you're my friend, if I was to tell you, this doctor is the best pediatrician for, for kids, you're likely to believe me more than if that doctor or that pediatrician was to come to you and tell you I'm the best in the game. So um, that's my, my that, that's my, uh, those are my preliminary thoughts, but I look forward to get enriched by the thoughts of my colleagues, uh, panelists. ESAL, it wasn't the time, but over the years you have got Sorry, I've lost you. Is it just me? No, we've lost oh, him. We lost him. We lost okay. him. Uh, as, as he comes on board, maybe it'd be nice to hear Julian's thoughts and Fiona's thoughts about this and Brenda. Absolutely. He's now back, though. Oh, good, good. It is, it is technology when you go on and off. That's when you know you're going, you're handling 21st century clients. Fiona, I'll, I'll, hand, I'll, I'll, I'll go last to, to Julian. Fiona, you, 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 you have worked with Max and it's one of the leading firms. I need, to be, I need us to be guided. It is one corporate client that you advise after the other then the other and it's a whole pool of corporate clients under your advisory what is what is the is it client satisfaction that brings in more clients to you or it's your vast experience because following you i have realized you advise on banking and finance you advise on oil and gas you advise on so many corporate transactions. Is it your versatile approach to legal practice? 
or is client management? What's the underlying factor? Thank you, Philip, and good to have you back. Um, I think between Nelson, Julian, and myself, we're thinking, okay, how does Philip want this to run out to pan out? Um, but having said that, good afternoon to everyone. Again, it's such an opportunity to, to speak to you, um, to speak to young lawyers, to speak to colleagues, to speak to you know other professionals. And I'm really looking forward to a very um, vibrant, engaging um, session this afternoon. Thanks for making the time to join us. Um, Philip, how have we made it or how have I made it? Um, one client after another, big clients. So unlike Nelson, I can't really claim them to single-handedly having sort of taken on this client. So really kudos to, to Nelson. Um, I think what Nelson is saying is that it's very possible just read really. Um, I've certainly very, been very you know, um, honored to, to have the opportunity to work with a firm like Marx. Um, and I think Marx is decades and decades of a lot of grit, a lot of hard work, and having a vision about who you want to be in the market, um, what you want to be known for, and then really going after it ruthlessly. Um, and then when you get the one client that will lead you there, you really treat them like royalty. You really absolutely bend over backwards to ensure they're happy. Something Nelson has attested to, which is really relationships. Um, it's not very superficial hellos and, you know, as you pay me, I'll smile. No, it's actually understanding them, anticipating where they're going, where they want to go, and really walking this road with them, hand holding them. I think they won't want to let go of your hand. They will absolutely need you each step of the way, particularly if you're delivering quality consistently. So in terms of how you know, I've managed or how the farm has managed to consistently bring in its really delivery consistently, good results. Now, how do you deliver good results consistently? It's also just personal discipline. It's instilling a culture of absolute discipline across um, all the way from the legal intern, all through the associates up until the partner, it's just discipline. Um, it's a lot of leadership as well. And, and that discipline for you as a person, as a lawyer, as an individual, it's, it's also one, it's, it's being keenly aware of, of, of what you want to be. So someone like me has certainly leveraged the brand of the firm um, someone like Nelson is the brand, and I'm sure um, with time, or someone like you as well, Philip, is the brand, but in time you quickly realize that there's succession issues and you cannot be the one and only solution to all your clients' um, issues. You absolutely need to delegate unless you want to fall apart yourself or your firm to fall apart. Um, so yeah, I think it really comes down to um, personal discipline and having a, a clear uh, blueprint of, of who you want to be as an individual as well. So I want to be a top lawyer in our market and I really want to be a top lawyer in corporate. And where exactly in corporate? So corporate means there could be mergers acquisitions, it could be private equity transactions. I want to be that person that when a, an investor is coming to Uganda, they will feel safe with me. They will feel they're in good hands. I want to be that person that is looked for um, on an energy deal, on an infrastructure deal, on, on a project. I, I, so what am I going to do? I'm going to look out for um, what skills do I need? And then who, how can I, how, how do I get these skills? I'm going to look out for trainings. I'm going to look out for conversations around it. I'm going to look out for people that are really good in that space. I'm going to look out for um, really a network. Um, but also like, you know, a skill set, continuous training, reading around where I want to be, who I want to be, just make sure I'm really, really good. And then I have the support and then I'm known by the people in that space as well. It's one thing to be good and be so skilled, um, but no one quite knows you and therefore you don't have the opportunity to deliver. So you absolutely need to be tapping into networks, find out who are the associations that deal, I don't know, with energy or oil and gas or um, who's the big player in private equity, who needs to know you, 
and make your way there slowly. Speak to other people. What does it take really? And then slowly these transactions start coming to you. And then you just need to nail one really well. It's word of mouth. Um, it starts to come out. So fortunately now it's such a digital, g digital market. You know, um, it's just absolutely revolutionized how we um, grow in our careers as well. We don't need someone to speak for us. It's about posting an article. It's about being present on social media, the different platforms. Um, it's about cleaning your profile and absolutely marketing yourself online when it comes to your website, when it comes to, I don't know, is it your Twitter? It's just being very calculated about the image you're cutting out um, and what you're standing up for, what sort of transactional work you're doing. Is it litigation? Is it corporate? Um, and, and that way, it's, it's a whole machine. It's a whole strategy, very calculated, very intentional in the back end um, to come out. But nothing disappoints, like blowing this trumpet and then time to deliver is just so make sure you have the skills as well. So yes, um, Philip, I think that's been the trick so far and it's never ending. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Fiona. I know it's never ending. Uh, Julian, can you share with us uh, the value aspect? I want to, I always call it a value aspect. Uh, you start a farm with a colleague, uh, this colleague along the way, it's changing line. Unknown to you, the, fa the files that have been coming in, one partner thinks those are his, fa his files. Then the other one, his files. Uh, many times when you're on strips here, you'll find a colleague from a classmate telling, I opened up a farm, we have started, I'm with so-and-so, two years down the road, they are separated. There's a farm here, Nyanzi Chiboneka, Nyanzi and Babazi. These two partners, whenever you go to their offices, when you go to Babazi, he'll make you feel like you have always been part of this farm, yet you're just visiting. When you go to Chiboneka, same story. They are joyous. They share with you all they have gone through. What is failing us, the younger advocates, in committing to work? I brought the Nyanzi Chivaldeka example because of the example that you have, the, the relationship you have with Chaga. Is it values? Is it work? Is it, where, where, where do we lose focus? Because we start together. We have been to school together. We have been in practice together. But the day we choose to join and open shop, the next day we are no more. And it's largely the reason why so many farms are opening up and so many farms are closing in the Young Advocates Fraternity. Juliet, be sincere with us. What has kept you with Chaga all these years that runs, the spirit that runs your farm? We need to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's now a journey of 18 years, since 2004. Meeting him when I was coming back to the country. I was living uh, abroad for like 10, 15 years. So then I needed to open up a shop and I needed somebody I can trust, who can trust me, who I can work with, uh, a kind of same character, but being different. But the key factor, I think you have said it, it's the objective, having a common understanding of the vision. If you have a common understanding that the positioning you want, as Fiona was mentioning it, our common objective was focusing on corporate matters. It was quite new in 2004 in Rwanda. People have been focusing on litigation as the principal attraction for business. And even every time you needed a return or talking to somebody, if you're a lawyer, you must go to court. So for us, we've been going to court and we are still going, but we've been reducing on that and having other, other associates focusing on that and having more experience to deal with litigation. So attracting more people, focusing on other things we are not uh, uh, good at doing have been also another thing of uh, keeping the same object objective, keeping the focus. 
So on uh, the relationship is having a partner is like a wedding. You need somebody you can trust and with who you can have dispute. But having dispute doesn't mean that you have to clash. It means that you may not have the same understanding of an issue, but you, will be, you can agree to disagree. And at the end, you find a solution that is in line with your objective. If you decide to move your office and spend, let's, our first decision was we have been spending $200 for renting an office. We decided to move and rent an office at the hotel with $1,000. So five times what we used to pay per month, meaning per year, it was becoming 12,000 that we have to share among two of us with only one client. So the only client we had was only paying the rent. So that was a risk that we were ready to, show, to share and to take the focus and the objective. But that is a decision you take saying, what is the argument, the pros and cons? But it, along the way, for sure, like a couple, you have disputes, you can have different friends. He has his own friend, I have my own friends. But the focus on the office is that I can call him even at 1 a.m., he can call me even 2 a.m. if needed and share any thoughts that we have. I have an idea, let's discuss it. Is it good, is it bad? This client is willing, we are willing to attract this client. How can we do it? Or this client is willing to come to us. Is it in line with our objective? Those are the discussion you have to have with your partner because it's a matter of reputation. Because if you decide to pay the rent and you're two or three, and one of them is not paying the rent, you, we end up uh, having an issue with your reputation as an office, as lawyer. And the first asset we have is reputation because we call the lawyer we know and that reputation is, is it a good lawyer? Is it the lawyer who deliver? Is it the lawyer who is available? And you can know some big names where you can have the competence you can have a good reputation, but you're not available. People will begin to not call you, call you anymore. So I have been having the mandate of president of the Rwanda Bar Association for two mandates, and the mandate in Rwanda is three years renewable, meaning six, six years. One of the challenges is to be available. So you have the reputation, you have uh, the, uh, the visibility, but if you're no longer available, you need a team. You need other people you trust who can deliver when you're not available and that your client will be able to trust. At a certain point, they can trust that they can deliver even more than you. They try to call you to say, okay, can I have somebody else? Can I have uh, Eve? Can I have David? Can I have Boniface or somebody else? So other people who can deliver when you're not available. You begin to be just the one maybe attracting a client because you can talk to them. You can try to foresee and uh, try to know in advance, what is the expectation of this client? How can I deliver? You have to put yourself in the shoes of that client. Otherwise, you will not be knowing exactly what is expected from you. And the client sometimes is not giving you the good information. He's, you have to listen, but at a certain point, you have to ask the key question. What do you expect from us? Do you want us to win this case? Do you want us to help you find a solution? You just want us to have, uh, to make a due diligence on this case, or you want a solution that was not even expected at the, at the beginning. So lawyers has to focus on providing solution. So that uh, asking for me and Eric Yaga, that even in the name case solution was, how do we find solutions for our clients? It can be different solution. You can come for uh, a debt recovery and you end up finding a partnership. If somebody cannot pay you back, but you have a partnership that can, in the long run, pay you back in another way, it's fine. If both parties are happy, it was going with the ADR in a way as one of the solutions that we can provide. Because when you begin by having a client, you, begin, or you end up being a mediator with the other side, if it can end up being a solution for your client, being a win-win situation. So, Find a partner you can have dispute with without clashing and having a common understanding of the objective. That's very key for me. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Nelson, uh, at Ashtiva, 
I, I realize, uh, borrowing from uh, Julien's presentation, I realize over the years, you have grown in numbers. What are you looking out for in these people that join you? Is it uh, their expertise? For instance, uh, Julian tells us that uh, if you are looking, if you're looking out for a partner, this is someone, for instance, their, their opening line was finding solutions. As members join Ashtiva, are they coming because of their expertise? What are you looking out for? Because I want a young lawyer to, who, who has opened shop to reflect on what he should look out for. I'll tell you for one reason here. When you open up, one, you find yourself with so many files. So you need someone who can maybe draft pleadings or someone who can help you adjourn matters as you look out for other clients. As strategists, what should we be looking out for? Thank you, Philip. Um, as Fiona and Julian have said, when you're starting any entity, you must start with the end in mind. Uh, we must, you know, when you're building any or any any building, you have to start with the with the blueprint, you know, the the architectural plans before you break ground. <clears throat> and so it is good, it is important to generally decide which direction you want your uh, law practice to go and determine which pieces you require to um, get you there. Um, as Philip and or as Nelson, we are not, uh, we don't know everything. Um, and so it is, it has been very important for me to get partners who are better, me, who are better than me in, uh, in, in other areas of practice. And so, you know, when I consider my partner in charge of commercial corporate, I, I, I regard her as far better than me when it comes to matters of, uh, uh, you know, private equity, uh, mergers and acquisitions, infrastructure, uh, intellectual property, uh, ins insolvency practice, she is far better than me. Um, when I think about my partner who is in charge of uh, real estate, banking and financial services, um, we got him from one of the top firms. He's really good. Um, you know, when I think about my partner uh, who is in charge of, uh, in, you know, uh, construction and finance, Again, she's, I, I don't know anyone better than her, you know, and I'm just saying this with humility in that space. When I think about uh, my, my partner who is in charge of um, uh, uh, energy and mining, um, again, she is really, really, you know, capable. But it's not only the technical competence that you look for. Um, you also look at alignment of values. Um, it is really key that you have at the core uh, values that are aligned and, and, um, and that you have this mutual respect and, um, and, and regard for each other um, and friendship. You know, uh, they say that uh, partnership is like marriage. Um, in, in other respects, it's even more critical than marriage because um, your reputation, your business investments, um, you know, are really hung on this. And, and, and your family's future uh, is also hung on this, you know? So it is really critical that um, in uh, choosing partners, you choose um, the kind of partners who you, your heart and your mind is at peace with. And also for you to, to be determined to be the kind of partner that the other uh, uh, colleagues who are your partners will be happy with. Um, so even as you choose other partners who are suitable for you, you should also be determined to be the right kind of partner for, for those colleagues. And, and so um, that is with respect to partnerships. It's a far more critical decision um, than, uh, than, than other, other members of, of, of staff. Um, but then every member of staff is important. And so, you know, when we think, when I think about, um, the colleagues who are now partners, they began with me, as, uh, three of them began with me as, uh, as, as uh, pupils. And, and they grew into the firm to become, you know, respected colleagues who I, I defer to, to their wisdom and technical brilliance. And so um, 
when when uh, hiring uh, at a lower level senior associate associate uh, even pupillage um, we are very keen to ensure that uh, you are the kind of person who is who has the right attitude you know um, we we have a saying here that uh, we can fix incompetence but we can't fix a bad attitude and so it is important that uh, when you're coming into an, any organization that you have a teachable spirit, you have um, a respectful uh, comportment, you have uh, um, an eagerness to learn, you have, um, you, have a, you have an attitude of being helpful, um, you are tone, you know, when uh, raising issues um, should be respectful. Of course, we encourage people to raise issues, um, to speak up and raise issues, but your tone is important. Um, and your ability to work in teams and, uh, and not to bring down other people um, is, is are some of the things that um, we, we, we encourage here as a culture uh, of, 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 um, of the organization. Um, we want the tea girl to feel as fulfilled as any partner in the farm. We want you know, an intern, a pupil, a, you know, an associate to feel that they're part of the same team that, uh, and that they're valued. And that any member of the team who undervalue undermines that is not um, is we we would be we would not mind losing an A player um, to retain or protect the value uh, you know the culture um, and the soul and the DNA of our farm uh, because we don't believe in star players we believe in a star team and so. Um, getting the, um, the, the people part right is so critical. Um, and if you were to tell me to choose between, um, uh, you know, an organization that has great clients or, you know, great briefs and an organization that has great people, I'd rather choose the organization with the great people. Yeah, so, so those are some of the things that we look out for. But as Fiona has said, uh, it helps when you have uh, developed yourself. You've invested in yourself to the level where um, you, you attract us to invest in you. So when we see that you've already invested yourself in, uh, in other, uh, other ways beyond just what you got in classroom and, um, and that um, you, know, you are, for instance, one of my colleagues who joined us at a very senior level, um, I met him in an insolvency training. And um, you know, so just talking to him during break time, he tells me that, look, um, I am from this farm and, um, and uh, I, I, this was, today was my, today was my leave day. I took leave to attend this training and I paid for myself, you know, and during the whole training, he was extremely, um, you could tell that this is an area of practice that he, he wants to develop himself intentionally. Um, and, and at times that extra uh, initiative does not cost much. It just means that you know you have uh, you have forfeited some you know Friday evening drinks, and you have paid a seven thousand shillings to attend you know one or two of these um, uh, you know short courses. You have uh, volunteered yourself in a constitutional uh, matter that the law society is uh, pushing for, and you have made a crit you know cr critical contribution towards it, and you have grown. Um, and and so when we see this personal initiative, we are always so eager to support you to get to where you want to be. And, you know, they say, you know, when a teacher, when a student is ready, the teacher appears. There must be that personal hunger that you have that would attract us to invest in you and would attract clients to also invest, you know, in, in, um, in the farm because they know that in that farm, Philip is there and, you know, he is already great in sports law he is very. He's already shown, you know, a lot of um, a lot of uh, competence in intellectual property. So, you know, your personal brand supports the corporate brand of of, of the organization. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, I think the people on call are also appreciating. One anonymous attendee says one key element for client care is the same delivery and care across the whole team. I think it's teamwork, uh, such as your staff are very important. Uh, what are the recruiting criteria, tips that the panel can suggest to ensure 
but I think this is a question after the comment. What are the recruit, recruiting criteria or tips that panels can suggest to ensure client needs are properly addressed? Uh, this will drive me into my question to Fiona. I want you to, to demystify, to demystify the, the, the belief that top law firms are only looking out for the cream of the crop. And they are leaving the rest to struggle down here. In a minute, is it true top law firms are only looking out for the cream of the crop? So that's, that's a very tricky question. Everyone is looking for the cream. Everyone's looking for the best talent in the market. Um, yes, attitude certainly plays a, a big role as well. Um, there has to be a cultural fit. There's no point in taking on somebody that's extremely talented, but it's such a sour grape. They're just going to be so toxic in the team. So absolutely, everyone's looking for that cream. So we are looking for those very keenly as well. Um, with each year that comes, with each crop that finishes, law school, LDC, we're looking to see who did really well. And then we have to sit down with them and see whether we're aligned in terms of where they want to go, how they see themselves fitting here. And if indeed there'll be a good fit at Max. Thank you. That's the minute. I, I, I raised that question because I want us down here to also think of whether we can go for them. And I think it is a yes. I think it's a uh, yes, absolutely. Year, then, thank you. Uh, desire, Desire Patihawa, I don't know where she, she is, but she says, as the, region, as the region gets to be an oil and gas producing region, what is your advice in promoting local content? Uh, to answer this, maybe Desire can visit the East African Law Society YouTube channel. There was uh, a high engagement on oil and gas in Tanzania on 1st April, where so many of these, where so many of these ideas were shared. Desire says, must be from Scotland. Please visit the East African Law Society YouTube channel. There has been a special, it was actually a special workshop, physical workshop on oil and gas. Uh, Julien, when should a firm choose to specialize? I don't want, uh, it shouldn't be specialized, but uh, when do you change strategy? You said you still go to court, still do practice. Down here, we, we say, you see, you'll never find Masembe in court. Because Masembe is one of the top boys at Max. So him, you'll never find him in court, save, it, save if it's that client. I recently was at the Court of Appeal and I found a senior counsel, Sebu Genyi. And I was like, hey, these people also come to court. Yet for us here, we are thinking after four years, I won't be going to magistrate courts. I won't be going to, so I need to know. The people need to be guided. Uh, this will drive me to, to the time factor. The time factor. When, when do you think in your opinion does a law firm break even? Julian. Yes, so the question of uh, going to court you, you have to make a balance. If you're making more money as a business by staying in the office and uh, serving clients, providing solution to clients and finding somebody else who will be going to court and getting better results than what you will get, that's the balance where you, you focus on what you do best. So for us, it was when I begin to withdraw from court, it was when I was defending a, a, an employer, a company, and the judge was asking, if you come in here, and the employee is just asking equivalent to $1,000 as damages, and we are sure that you're getting more than that as fees, why should we... Uh, so that was an introduction from the judge. Like the fact that I'm appearing in court was a problem for my client because the assumption for the judge is that I'm being paid more than what the damages the, uh, the employee is asking. So it was like, okay, the next day, the next, uh, that was an opening uh, hearing. So I, I, I had no interest 
and my client had no interest for me to appear in court after that statement. We've been winning that case, but not me appearing anymore. So it was an associate going to court afterwards, having different arguments, not having that bias from the judge. And for that case, it was making sense. But for a corporate matter, if I've been making, uh, writing an article or on arbitration, if I'm appearing, it can be an added value if I'm the one uh, pleading. In that case, I can have a reason to go and it can be in the interest of the client. So that's when you begin to say, I'm specialized in this and there is another partner or another associate who is specialized in another field who would be better appearing in that one. So specialization is usually depending on client, depending on matters, you and depending on what you think you're capable of doing. If you're on, if you have been working in tax for 10 years or working with the tax revenue authority in your jurisdiction, at a certain point you go private, you may be specialized in tax by the fact of your experience. If you have been dealing with criminal matters since uh, going out of university, you may be specialized in criminal matter. But for me, I was uh, dealing with corporal, corporate governance, doing my master's in that field, dealing with arbitration, reaching the, the board of the arbitration center in Rwanda. So that is a field of corporate matter, commercial arbitration, companies, due diligence of banks and so. So that is my field by experience. Because when clients come to me, they expect me to know that field. A client never come to me expecting me to know the family law. But there is another lawyer being young or senior who will be specialized in family law. And wherever somebody think about a divorce or a succession matter, that is the name coming in mind. So what you have to do as a young lawyer by broadcasting on YouTube, by uh, writing articles, by commenting laws appearing in the gazette is to appear as a specialized uh, lawyer in that field. So whatever I think about the field, being even a lawyer, a fellow lawyer, I think, oh, Philip is the guy for that. If I need uh, clarification, I have to call my fellow lawyer for this special uh, sector. So like for labor law, I may have three or four people, I may call for clarification. I may direct client if I'm having a conflict. But for that, I've seen them on YouTube explaining the new law or procedure. I've seen them on uh, an article commenting on constitutional matter or appealing for that uh, specific area of law. And that is not my field. So if a client needs somebody, I will be having two or three names to say, okay, this is the guy. Call him, send an email, send a WhatsApp. I'm not specialized in that field. Within our team, it's so and so. Even if I have to appear to give confidence to the client, it's just appearing for the first meeting. The other meeting will be with uh, another colleague because of uh, reputation. And we call the lawyer we know. If they don't know your name, they will not call you. If they don't know your, you, you know something they don't know, you can provide a solution, they will call you. Wow, thank you. Uh, on next, as as we as we, as we move, uh, participants are, are really happy about the de deliberations. Uh, I see, I see, very good comments. They are, they are calling it insightful. I think we are touching the areas they want. There is a question here of when, when is the right time to have or invite partners? It's from Judith. I think from what we have shared, the right time might be from the start or as you move along. Uh, for instance, Chaga and uh, Julien started at the beginning. Uh, Nelson, along the way, he has even found people in workshops and they have become partners. My other question, or the direction I need us to, to be guided into now. Fiona, I have opened up my law firm. I need, I need 
Should I call it bidding? I need work from a bank, Centenary Bank. I need work from uh, a multinational. What are the requirements? Because we did this session to be as open as what you have done before. If I have a law firm running, Diadem Advocates, there is, I'm looking out for business. I think we'll share this with Nelson, being a business government and a strategy specialist. But the three of you will share with us. In Uganda, what are the basic requirements of a law firm? Apart from the incorporation certificates and all that, uh, do I need to be updated with uh, revenue? Do I need to be? Do I need to have memberships in associations? What are the, these things that your corporate clients are looking out that I need to have to tap into such clientele? Thank you, um, Philip. That's such an interesting question because indeed we go through this on a daily as well. Um, you know, we've been talking about uh, which, how do you know whether to specialize? How do you know whether to go energy? How to, whether to go private equity or debt collection? How do you know? Um, and of course, there were some really good points there. And, you know, of course, you look inside and see if you have the skill set. And then you have the skill set and the passion, you, you jump and go for it. So the same, 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 um, you know, scenario, same scenario here. Um, you want the big bank, you want the, which we do, all of us. Um, why? Because then they really add to the bottom line and they, they just give you a happier, they, they, they make your life easier, I think. Um, but that big bank, that big multinational, how do you get them? How do you get into their space, into their heads, onto their radar? Um, this is something we also um, have to deal with on a daily. Um, so there's a lot of work in the back end um, before there's any sort of success. Um, I think Nelson was talking about uh, that snowball effect. It's not going to be overnight that there's a particular magic hat trick. Um, and then you suddenly have them No, it's that small hammer that you have. Um, and you know that there's this big wall that you absolutely need to get over and it's standing between you and that bank or that multinational. And you're gonna hammer and hammer daily, like without quitting, hammer, hammer, hammer. And then finally that wall actually falls down and everyone is thinking, oh my God, that last swing, right? It was not that last swing, it's all these little hammers. Now those last hammers, I'm going to break them down. Those hammers are first of all research, really. I'm looking at what, let me see, standard chartered? or I'm looking at, I don't know, Total, um, you know, household names. Everyone would like to have that big anchor client. So I need to research this bank. I need to research that multinational. I need to understand its offering, its, its, its strategy in the market, um, where it wants to be seen, what it's rolling out, how it's rolling it out. Um, I need to understand who are the key players in their space who um, impacts on their business, who, who they want to be connected with, um, who is important in their world. And then I'll sort of map out to understand, okay, this is my value proposition to them because I think, first of all, I will make sure they don't fall apart when it comes to just the legal technical stuff. So their contractual stuff will be okay. Um, their, I don't know if they take a if it's, if it's a bank, for instance, um, I have good connections with the lands registry. I will make sure, you know, my turnaround time when perfecting their securities is perfect. I'll come through that. So it's really about very, very good research on each target client um, in terms of what they want, where they're looking to go, where they want to play. And then who are the key decision makers there? try as much as you can. Of course, you might go cold turkey and say, hi, my name is Philip. Um, I would like to you know, uh, make a value proposition to you guys because you've obviously made this watertight value proposition. You've sat down and said, this is where I'd add value to them. Um, but many times, maybe they won't know you and therefore the person will see your email and just say, who is this wanting to come in and meet me and to do a value proposition? And that's when you go to their network. Who are the key decision makers in this place? 
Um, who do they know that I know? Where do they generally hang out that I hang out with? Why know somebody that can sort of introduce me? So it's about um, leveraging your network as much as possible to try and get a foot in the door to make a value proposition to them. Sometimes you're lucky because there'll be a bid or an, an expression of interest advert in the papers. There you don't need any introductions. Um, just do your research again, put together a value proposition and put it on their table best way you can. And then cross your fingers and hope that you'll be the best and that it will be a very objective um, evaluation and that you know you come out on top. Um, but short of having um, the introduction by somebody that knows a, a key decision maker on the inside, you bid your time. Um, you try and do value proposition here and there, free training, um, do thought leadership on, on, on an issue that would affect them. So right now there's this whole issue around whether foreign banks can lend to Ugandan businesses. Basically write something topical that gets you onto their radar. Um, slowly you'll see them sort of gravitate to you. They'll give you a chance. They maybe won't give you the biggest deal initially, They'll give you a small, small, but when you get it, you grab it with both hands and make sure you don't drop any ball. You run and you deliver. Um, and then that will get you another one, that will get you another one. So that's how I've seen it work, really. It's about being very calculated again, um, identifying the people you think you would add value to, right? Um, you've got the skill set, you know what they want, you know where they want to go, and you know exactly how you're going to add this value. So when you speak to them, it's actually very meaningful. You're not just bluffing. You're telling them, look, I've analyzed you guys. This is where you play strong. You're a little bit weak here. This is where I come in. And when I come in, this is how I'll sort of add value. So I'll turn it around. Just give me that one chance. And this is how I've done it for other people, by the way. Um, and then you start to build your, your, your profile slowly. Yeah, and you, you know, cross. But as I said, it's that hammer. You don't quit. You stay at that door because you want to be let into that door. You, you keep, there's, there's nothing too strong. I mean, uh, and, you know, please forgive me if, if you sort of don't believe in the Bible, but there's that story about, you know, the, the men that went around that wall of Jericho and they just wouldn't stop marching and marching and it finally collapsed. So, and, you know, many people will think you're absolutely mad, a small hammer, really, on this big wall, but you're hitting and you will not quit. You will not quit it eventually gives way. It's about bidding your time. You don't quit. You have the value to add. You have the technical skill. Just don't quit. Believe in yourself. Yeah. Julian, something needs, seems to be burning. <laughs> oh. We need to chip in. Oh, what I can say is that usually like banks, you have been asking, one of the way to win a returner with a bank is to win against them at least one case. Once you win against the bank, they will return, they will got your name. The legal advisor of that bank will know what did we do. We have the best lawyer in, inside. We have the house, we have been outsourcing the best law firm. So how can we lose this case? Who has been on the other side? So at a certain point, you may be contacted. You may not be the one contacting them. So, but again, the YouTube articles you're writing can be also an element to say, this guy is specialized in our field. If they have to make a debt recovery, you send them a letter of the mistake they are doing. Like banks forget many things in the procedure. You can write to the legal advisor telling him, this is the things you're missing in your case. He may call you though for the next case he has because he has the ability to select two or three law firm and test them. So the next time he may be not uh, terminating the other contract he has, but adding you on the list. And then you have the opportunity to sell. So that they have to call the lawyer they know, but to be on the list of the lawyer they know, it's either by your capacity that was uh, published in an article or on YouTube presenting a subject or by fighting them in a way, having a client, you show sure that with that file you can win against them. If not attracted by the bank, the other law firm will, may be attracting you. Uh, the one already working with the bank may end up saying, okay, we need that guy in our team. Nelson, is the situation different in Kenya? Oh, actually, uh, Fiona and uh, Julian have captured it really well. 
Um, I wouldn't add a thing except to say that uh, my short experience uh, running a farm, I've come to conclude that um, this is to believe in this 80-20 rule that 80% uh, of your revenue will come from 20% of your clients. <laughs> and so um, it is important, you know, all the things that uh, Fiona has talked about regarding understanding your client, the, the target client, uh, building um, pathways to creating value and getting their attention, like Julian has said, um, getting their attention by uh, winning, winning a case where they're involved. Um, you know, all the things that, um, you know, Fiona has talked about, Julian has talked about, um, require quite a bit of work. And so what I have found to be useful is to have um, a dream list or wish list of clients that I consider not more than uh, 20 clients that I consider, you know, these are uh, the dream list clients that um, we would like to, we would like to secure. <clears throat> um, and so in the, in the same way, I would like to encourage uh, our colleagues not to spread themselves too thin because the kind of investment that uh, Fiona has talked about and Julian has talked about to build value, to understand the client, know where it matters to them and offer even initially, um, you know, in pro bono terms, some support or help um, requires quite some commitment. But when you spread yourself thin and, and, and just, um, you know, basically hit and run and, you know, just look at clients generally without having a clear marked list, <clears throat> you may end up not being effective. So as uh, has been said by Fiona, even ourselves, we still are in that journey of uh, acquiring new clients. And, and, and therefore, um, you know, there was a time I was very obsessed about just looking for about 100 corporate clients in a year. But then I realized I'm spreading myself too thin. I'm not being effective. I'm not being impactful. I am getting exhausted, very little results. Um, but when we, you know, switch that and, you know, now I only target 20 corporate clients, <clears throat> the kind of clients who actually make a, an impact on the bottom line, um, then things are turning for the better. And, and so it is not so much, you know, um, you know, the same way they say you can either grow organically or you can grow strategically. There are some clients who will come to you by virtue of being in the right place at the right time. But then there are, there are certain clients who you have to be intentional about. And, and that's the majority of the clients. And so, you know, um, if you start the year and understanding clearly that these are the 20 or the 10 clients that I am going to pursue this year and dedicate your effort in understanding what they are up to, understanding what their priorities are, understanding what the changing regulations are uh, that affect their industry and, and you know, volunteering information, uh, volunteering to do training, uh, asking them whether they have considered this or they consider the other, and, and asking yourself, who do you know? Who knows someone in that organization who can then give you an opportunity to offer free training? Um, and the other bit that, that uh, Fiona has talked about, which is I'd like to emphasize, is patience. Um, one of our clients, you know, um, uh, one of these uh, Bretton Woods organizations, um, you know, it's, it's taken us four years to get the first assignment from them. And, and this was just about, you know, um, three months ago. So, but it has been four years of patience, four years of um, still, you know, validating our value to them, uh, four years of deepening our relationship with them. So there's an element to relationships that requires patience and, and you know, validation of your value over time. So, so, you know, um, the third thing I would say and the last thing I would say is just <clears throat> being very, um, very perceptive about the opportunities in the market. Um, for instance, there, in Kenya, there are a lot of law, reform, law reforms around land and around the private-public partnership. And, you know, we then decided that this is going to be our way in to certain clients. And, and we then began to hold the hands of clients who are not even, we are not even on their panel, 
but you know, ahead of time telling them that, uh, you know, we could do this and the other for you. And because of that, you know, for our existing clients, because of holding their hands, because of the reforms that were going on, you know, our relationship with them has been elevated. But for the clients who were not who are not on their panel, um, they are now um, we're just about now to be to be confirmed into their panel because of how we were there for them when um, they were confused, unsure, you know, are quite worried about their future, the future in, in respect to their you know um, the, their interests in in land and and uh, you know bank securities. Um, so, so that's what I would say, you know, uh, that it, 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 the certain changes and developments in the market um, give you an opportunity to actually then, um, because they, they sort of, uh, they, 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 they flatten the opportunities for everyone. And it's, it's the person who, you know, so, I mean, the, the law reforms, uh, the bigger law firms that have been there earlier than, um, than any lawyer here, would not be advantaged more than us. We are all learning. And so if you are able to see, to connect developments in the market and say, you know, uh, this can lead to the other, and therefore this is something that would be of interest to this client. Um, some of our clients are also facing um, concerns about the changing regulations, banking regulations with respect to, you know, digital lending. And so then, you know, you offer your support sorry allow me just to say this which has come to my mind as well and the other thing you could you could also do is uh, offer value just beyond law you know ask yourself you know what is it that is a pain point to these clients um that you could support them in or what is this uh, ambition they have um that you could support them in and and offer that support and and by because of that then it gives you access to the leadership of that organization, you have their ears and 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 uh, and and you 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 know they they consider you a trusted advisor, um, and and be willing to like one of the clients who we've been serving you know um, and is our key client, we started doing affidavits for them at no cost because we wanted to get that opportunity to get into um, into their panel, uh, but but you know like uh, just thinking about what opportunities there are outside the legal legal profession the, the strict legal uh, legal parameters and asking yourselves what business value can i offer to this uh, insurance company to this um, you know um, real estate company to this uh, you know university that could ease in their problems um, and you see the key thing um, and, and allow me to to make this joke here, uh, forgive me if I'm being uh, I'm being inappropriate. Um, the thing about uh, you know the ladies who and and men who have dated know that um, the, if if a lady does not want to date you, then the worst mistake she should do is give you airtime, because then if you if they allow you to continue speaking to them, then eventually they'll agree agree to start dating you. And so it's the same way that uh, even with the banks, even sorry, even with the clients that um, uh, the big clients that we are all pursuing, when you get airtime with them, when they begin to trust you, even if you brought you came in through an angle that is not strictly legal, you know, not 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 legal, but you know, from the legal perspective, as a lawyer, um, the value that you brought through that relationship, and now they are able to speak to you. You are talking to the MD, you are talking to the uh, company secretary, you're talking to the chairman of the board you are becoming, um, you know, they're confident, you are becoming, you know, uh, a key a key part of their decision-making framework. Then, you know, that gets you into the frame where, you know, a, an opportunity for you to now say, look, um, we could also offer you, um, uh, you know, legal support. And the other thing that uh, some of our colleagues have done, which has been fantastic, is uh, also growing yourself through raising your profile. You know, becoming the chair of uh, the arbitration uh, president, rather of the arbitration uh, uh, chartered institute of arbitrators for for Julian, uh, becoming the chair of uh, you know the law society or the president of the law society, um, becoming uh, the chair of uh, the chamber the chamber of commerce, uh, becoming the ch the chair of a tribunal, becoming the chair of uh, the ch the chair of uh, a key institution. 
it raises your profile, it, 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 uh, it gets you into the room, it gives you access to the room where decision makers are. And through that, then you are able to build your relationships and, and, uh, and bring in your law firm as well. That's so wonderful. Uh, from the Q&A, we have a few questions. Uh, Lilian Nyangasi, name sounds so Kenyan. Lilian Nyangasi is asking about fee notes. Lilian, there's a, there is a webinar we held on uh, handling, on law as a business, a young lawyer's guide to an efficient practice model. It highlighted most of these things, how you build clients, how you, how you, there's a, there's also another question on uh, on uh, file management. Most of those, um, most of the answers are in uh, that that webinar. It was about a year ago. And then there was also another webinar on to specialize or generalize. It was a young a young lawyers. It's a young lawyers dilemma. So please visit the. Uh, ELS website, sorry, ELS uh, YouTube link. Most of these, uh, all of them, I won't say most of these, all of the webinars are posted there. Normalize visiting the websites and uh, YouTube channels for, for guidance. I always follow, I always follow, I always listen to Nelson's podcasts. I don't know how I landed into them, but in a way I found myself, it was about demystifying something was so interesting and so and so guiding. So I've made it, I've made it my work to always visit top law firm websites, to always read articles from these top law firms. Uh, on a daily, as I get to office, I'll open about three, three law firms that I follow consistently. There are questions also. There's a, a member who is asking something about uh, kindly share your experiences on difficult clients. We, we cannot say it has all been good for you. You have also lost a client. Uh, how do you handle the situation? There are difficult clients. There are difficult clients. How do you manage this? Can this, let's first hear from Julian. He has, he has been so quiet. Yes, so we, we sometimes have difficult clients. Is to usually to understand the reason why they are not satisfied. Is it a matter of uh, responding or uh, responsiveness? Is it a matter of availability or is it a matter of quality of service being provided? Did we listen to what to the expectation of the client? So we try not to blame the client. Yes, we lose the client in a way because he's unhappy but we try to mitigate the reputation by even trying to engage with the client after a few days a week to try to know what was the issue. If I was the one dealing with the client or my team, maybe Eric department will be the one contacting the client and trying to know what was wrong with Eric, with Julian um, way of managing your file and et cetera. So for us to go to try to solve the matter internally. So it's one of the way then the client will know that even if there has been a problem with his uh, particular case or if, if there was uh, a misunderstanding, it's not the law firm to blame. So because not only that client may be unhappy, but if they go out and happy, they may destroy your reputation with 10 potential clients. So you don't, usually we, we try to not just sit on our, on our chair and say, okay, that was a bad client, let him go we need to understand the reason why that person or that company is going. If it is uh, genuine, like uh, if they have been having five years with us and the internal rules requesting them, request them to change, it's normal. But they may come back or we try then to, get, to secure a certificate of satisfaction. If they can sign it, it means that we are okay. So those are the kind of things we try to, to mitigate and, and find solutions in, in practice. But the other way, even if they go, you still have like, when you incorporate a company, you have the board members passport, you have the managing director uh, ID, meaning you have the birthday. So put it on uh, reception, keep it in record of that. You send just a happy birthday. You may be the only one sending it that day. You may send flowers if it is a lady, 
you never know what happened. It costs almost nothing. And it's very, uh, people like it. Thank you very much. I've been told of uh, an advocate here. Uh, I think he, uh, he has taken on that line. He'll call a client to find out, out about their sick auntie. Okay. <laughs> it's a very good line. It's a very good line. Uh, Fiona, is it the same experience you've had with, uh, how have you handled those tough clients? Because the, the essence here is to, to see that I retain and also add on. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's never an easy one, um, dealing with a difficult uh, client. And I think a lot of the time, yeah, you, 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 you learn as you go along um, because clients will be difficult for different reasons. And I think um, Julian has touched on perhaps poor service, a scenario where you've had the client for a while, you've been having a good relation, they're happy with you. But then maybe one thing goes bad and they just do not understand how you let, how, how you, you miss something that could have cost them or has cost them. I mean, that's a lot of PR, managing a lot of PR um, and, you know, it's, it's always really tough to see them go to ask you to give the file to the next lawyer. Um, but it's also just one of those candid conversations of, you know, you need to sort of eat the humble pie and acknowledge where you're completely off. Like, totally agree this was sort of, um, you know, completely unacceptable. Um, you know, if there's been any mileage with them, you're telling them to look at where you've done really well. And this was just the exception, you know, profuse apologies. Um, just try and make up as much as you can. So there are other clients where they are not in the bag and they're actually trying to get on board. So it's, it's, it's Julian's, ex, Julian's example has been when they've been with you, maybe you've messed up and they need to go um, and, oh, it's a difficult conversation. But now when you have somebody that's quite difficult um, and you can see red flags ahead of even signing the engagement letter with them. <laughs> um, and of course there's, there's, you know, we all want, you know, the fees they will pay. But if, if you've spotted them a mile and they've told you even ahead of coming to you that, look, I've been through five lawyers. Hmm? The one, this was the, what was wrong with them. The other one, that was wrong with them. The other one, I mean, it's, 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 it's very rare that five lawyers collectively ah, are all incompetent or are all, you know, basket cases of sorts as that client would probably want to allege. Um, it's just very clear that that client has ex, ex, exacting standards, like their standards are way out of this world. Either they don't expect you to be sleeping, to eat any food, I don't know, they're expecting something just out of, it's, it's just almost inhuman. Um, it's, 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 again, it's, it's a delicate balance between your reputation, because these kind of people, again, will go around absolutely uh, um, blacklisting you and totally messing up your reputation. Like those people can't handle this. I, I give them a chance to, to, to handle this and, you know, they didn't even respond or they, it's a tough discussion, but I think we've had an experience with one of those. And I think the way we handled it was to say, because now they wanted to bundle us with an existing lawyer, someone that was handling a matter. Um, and they were saying they're just not cutting it. They're just not cutting it. And just so you know, before we arrived at them, that person assured us that they could actually take it on, right? We told them that A, B, C had failed. Then we gave them a chance, but they're not cutting it. So you guys get on board because um, with your network, with your experience and expertise, you will give them guidance. Now, of course, lawyers are big egos as well. <laughs> lawyers. Imagine now getting onto someone's matter and starting to tell them this is the direction you should go. And in fact, you've been doing it so wrong because you see the client is unhappy and that's why they brought us on board. It's just, um, so it's one of those where you really have to study the case carefully. Um, it was one of those where should we call the existing lawyer? Do they even know that the client is talking to us? What are their views? And the existing lawyer was a good friend. 
Um, but it's still one of those where you don't want them thinking you're trying to take the client. Um, very difficult, but it turned out that that particular client, I think, asked us for a quote about, uh, for, for, you know, what we would be charging, where value we kept, we, asked, we kept asking him, where exactly do you want us to add value? Where, where is the gap? Because that lawyer is handling this, handling that. So it's a candid discussion about the facts um, where you actually see you're going to add value. And if you're not going to add value, then don't step into somebody else's um, acknowledge and say, actually, they're doing the right thing. We would do the same. We would take the same strategy. It's just about beating your time around this area because maybe they're having challenges here and there, but that can be resolved. To, 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 to get somebody else on board is just more fee. Like administratively, things could fall in the gaps because of communication gaps between. It, it was a long discussion. Um, they didn't get on board. Um, on any other day, we would love to have them. Absolutely. Um, but you just have to be really, really careful um, about what you're getting into. Um, in other cases, um, it's about fees or it's about a skill set you don't have. Um, and on the skill set, it's just being very candid about the fact that, you know what, um, we do debt, debt, debt collection, um, but for certain debt collection, for instance, you might be better off working with this particular person who we know will do a really good job. Um, that one, we rather we refer to you. We rather refer you to another lawyer. So you're not dropping them completely. Um, you're putting them in the hands of someone you better have researched and you're sure will do a good job. Otherwise, your, your name is going down too. Um, if it's about fees, difficult conversation, um, again, find middle ground. Um, where will they meet you? Where will you meet them? So yes, um, difficult clients. Um, they they yeah they don't come in one shape. There are many shapes and sizes, and you navigate it as you go along. Nelson, as you discuss your 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 experience, uh, there's a question from Biamazima Joshua. He says clients in Uganda have the habit of calling several lawyers to gather information. Most lang most young lawyers are victims to this trend. How do you cut the client short? Yeah inform them that you will charge them for that conversation. I've actually, from personal experience, I think when, when I opened my boutique law firm, I chose to cut short, deliberately cut short. Uh, my question is always, uh, uh, is this legal or something we can just talk about on phone? Uh, you know, it is something legal. I'm like, okay, come to office. That has been my my way of handling it. If it's a question that requires my input of legal knowledge, I always call them to office. Uh, I need to hear from you, uh, your tough client, and how you get, how you, you, I think how you switch from giving advice on phone to bring the client to office. Yeah, Philip, I think you've, you've nailed it, really. Um, it's, it's really just, of course, um, you know, I think about the situation of us and doctors. Um, we call doctors when we require some first aid kind of uh, advice and guidance. But beyond that, um, you know, the doctor will actually tell you for us to be able to handle this comprehensively, please come to the clinic. Uh, let me see the baby, let me see you, let me examine you physically. And of course, coming to the, to the clinic, therefore means that you have to pay consultancy fee. Um, when clients come to the office, the first meeting usually for us is, uh, is, is, is we don't charge for that initial meeting because we're trying to understand the opportunity. But beyond that, then it will be clear the basis upon which we are uh, going forward. Um, and and that will be that uh, you know there is we are we'll be proposing to you uh, for this kind of assignment for us to give you um, uh, an analysis of this then you know this is what we'll be proposing to charge. There are there is also a bit of wisdom that you require to make it depends with who is calling you. You know there are people that you know are just um, um, are just out. You you can be able to judge whether the person is taking advantage of your friendship or that the person is someone who has 
potential, in a relationship that has potential to grow into something significant. Um, and even despite the fact that we have that rule about, uh, you know, the first, uh, the, the meeting after the first um, engagement being uh, the basis upon which we will charge you, uh, we make exem exemptions, uh, especially because we know different groups and different people have different potential. We are able to quickly read and, and tell whether there is um, there's an opportunity here or there's nothing. Uh, for instance, one of the clients who we served about two years ago, um, we ended up disagreeing about the fees that we should charge in that case. But the process of handling him for the three or four meetings that we attended, the client, the, the three other people he came with, one of them was a senior, a senior official in a, in, a, in, a, in a neighboring government, you know, in a, in a, a neighboring country. And, and because of that, um, you know, uh, a year down the road, that person calls us and tells us, you know, you remember me, I came with so-and-so for your meeting, for this meeting, um, there's, an, there's, a, you know, there's a project going on in my country and we'd like you to come and, um, uh, you know, uh, serve us, you know, come and advise us on this transaction. And, um, and that became our, our opening uh, engagement with uh, this government, this country, which we now currently are serving um, in helping them to structure projects. So in the same way, um, we could have uh, dismissed them from the first meeting and said, you know, uh, our rules are firm and, and clear, you know, pay up or there's no second meeting, there's no third meeting. But those additional two meetings then have ended up giving us another relationship, it totally dependent of the client who we, you know, we parted ways with. And, and, and Fiona is right, you know, from the first two or three conversations, you can judge whether you are aligned in terms of values with this client, uh, whether this client has abused other, uh, you know, lawyer relationships in the past. Um, typically, we get uh, three or four occasions where we have had lost a client to a, a rival law firm. Um, the lawyers have called us to ask us what, what was the what was the history? Help us understand what 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 is leading you to uh, this client to moving away from you. Um, other than those three opportun those three situations, we've never lost um, a client, and to my knowledge, at least. And uh, and and you know, there may be some circumstances where you look at the greater picture. Um, the third that third case where we um, chose. To, 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 to resign from representing the client, it's because we were so keen about that category of clients um, that we said, look, um, this client has been very difficult to handle, but we know that they have a potential of, you know, um, uh, uh, going out there to the public court and making certain allegations which are, are not, are baseless. So we got the, trans the, the, case, the court case to a certain level and she wanted us to appeal. And we told her, no, we, uh, at this stage, we will not, will not go beyond this. We recommend that you take another law firm, another lawyer to continue with you. And, um, you know, she then said, right, raising issues that I paid you so much money. We said, here's your, all the money you paid us, here it is. Yeah, we have taken the file to this, mat to this level, all the fees you paid us, here, have it. Um, but for us, we were so keen to protect our reputation and, and not to have a lawyer or so, uh, sorry, a client who um, is, uh, is, is being rude and disrespectful to ourselves and our colleagues. Um, it's, it's very important for us that all our colleagues also enjoy the relationship with the clients, that the clients also respect them. And uh, we have had to defend our, our colleagues many, you know, not many times, a few times, where clients have, uh, you know, shown disrespect, um, made passes at them. You know, uh, a lot of our colleagues, my colleagues here, are uh, female, and um, and you know, uh, you know, clients have made, you know, un 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 unwanted uh, gestures or passes at them, which are not uh, are not are not uh, acceptable in our work environment. And so we 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 are very also protective of our colleagues. Um, and the key thing, in my view, is to um, manage that relationship sensitively, 
delicately uh, and to manage the transition delicately to ensure that you minimize risk. Uh, it is not just that you are right that matters. It is that even beyond that um, uh, opportunity, you know, in the current context where people, um, there are so many uh, people in, in, in WhatsApp groups and social media platforms, it can just take one person saying this about your firm, and then it, it, it gives a bias to, you know, a thousand people or 500 people uh, who may not give you an opportunity to explain from your end. So there are some situations that you can't avoid and, and you know, it is what it is. Um, there are situations where you will still do your best and, and the client is still dissatisfied and they still talk negatively about you. Um, but, you know, in, uh, in, in Kiswahili, they say tender member nenda zako, you know, so you, you do good and, and leave the rest to, to God to, to defend you. Wow, thank you. You see, I never stop asking when I get chance. Recently, I appeared before the head of the family decision and the family division of the high court here. And uh, the good justice told me, Philip, you can even refuse instructions. You don't need to take all instructions. He gave me an experience when he was still practicing. Uh, as he moved out of court, he overheard his client telling the clerk to the judge that this lawyer is so difficult. Imagine I gave him my money, but he has been dragging and dragging. He called the, cl the client, told her, Madam, let's go to the farm. I refund your money. You take your instructions to another lawyer. Because he told me, in his mind, he knew, if you're out of court and this client is bad-mouthing you with the secretary to the judge, the clerk to the judge, then he can do so to so many other lawyers. So he set that client aside and moved on, which is very good. Uh, from what my take home is, as the young lawyers, it's not that every, every other client will be taken on. Uh, we have learned how to manage situations. Uh, Julien, I'm getting comments from... Uh, from uh, these comments must be from your 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 jurisdiction because they are French. Belle presentation, great presentation, I think. And uh, there is also someone who thanked you, Julien. <clears throat> you will be talking to young arbitrators. To young arbitrators on fifteenth. It's it's a free to members who are tuned in. It's going to be a free. A free session. You can visit the, it's the African Arbitration Center website, but Chigali will be hosting the, the East African Arbitration AGM or something. Please visit the website, visit the website, register in. You'll be hearing more from Julien. Julien, uh, my question in line with uh, your arbitration line. Um, the issue of moving into the direction, moving your farm into the direction to specialize. Sometimes, uh, for instance, issues like arbitration, they are quite expensive. And when you start practice, you don't want to feel much of the, of the expense on you. I have done, I have personally done, I have an interest in sports law. So I have done sports mediation, I've done sports arbitration, but I've done it in Nairobi. There's the, there's the Nairobi, Med, it's the Nairobi Med, MTI, Nairobi, Mediation Training Institute, Nairobi. I've also done a course with CIRRB, uh, Nairobi, sports arbitration. How do I get or move the firm into a direction that is forthcoming. For instance, arbitration right now seems to be the new mode of practice. Or need, we need to, in, in, in other words, seems to be, we need to seem to be looking at new solutions, mainly with the 21st clientele. These are online people, we are holding meetings online. 
it's not the normative or traditional way of practice environments that we had. The listeners out there need to know how are we moving? Because it's a bit funny and tricky that practice is now changing. A few years ago, we never had online filing. We never had uh, online systems mainly. I think in Kenya, they moved online. Uh, the courts in Kenya, uh, here in Uganda, we have gone into ECMIS. However, as young lawyers, we are still stuck in the mindset of uh, now ECMIS, the online systems are not user friendly to us because we think at K Solutions, you even have a department, a technology department that will handle that, which we don't have here. What is your advice to this law firm that is looking for a solution to handle satisfactorily should I just move away from and go from the normative and go online? How do I balance the two? Uh, I would not advise to change overnight. Usually it's coming through clients. So you'll be getting one client asking you to be a counsel in arbitration, or you will be advising as a co-counsel to another uh, lawyer in an arbitration proceeding. You can also serve uh, as a clerk, being a young lawyer to the arbitration panel, then advising them, making research for them, for the panel of arbitrator, or being uh, a co-counsel or being advising the, the counsel in arbitration. So there is different, different roles. You can be a different actors in arbitration. So you can have an entry point. You can select one of those. And the first one is to be able to advise the client when signing an agreement that there will be arbitration as uh, in case of dispute. So in that case, you can still follow your client. In case there is a dispute, you go to arbitration. Whatever you were supposed to be uh, bringing to the court, you will be bringing it to the arbitration. And then the opponent will be responding, then we'll be learning on how arbitration is being conducted. The issue sometimes with arbitration is that it's confidential. You don't have a, a hearing date. It's only parties who are aware. There is no advertisement of this case happening on this day in this room. So you may need to be one of the parties that way you can volunteer to help for you to learn how it is being conducted. And by learning, you parties in the case will call you back. You will be having a client. Then you will not be afraid to go to arbitration. People are saying it's uh, expensive. It's another thing that expensive compared to what? Because arbitration is final and binding usually. If I go to first instance, there is an appeal, then an appeal to the court of appeal, then a potential Supreme Court case. How many years? So how many hours? If the, the lawyer is charging, is charging per, per hour, it may be costing a, more time, more money, and uh, maybe the solution you're providing or the, what the client is expecting, it's a confidential matter and fast solution. If it is taking six years, if it is taking five years, it's not a solution for that client. So you need to find a consider alternative solution, mediation or arbitration as one of the potential solution together with uh, the court and litigation. So that, that is one of the way, but being a, a young lawyer, writing articles on the procedure, learning on the award that has been issued, visiting arbitration centers, because as a young lawyer, you may sign maybe a confidential uh, note and access some being a visitor or intern in a law in arbitration center. You can have access on the way it is being conducted on the kind of fees, the calculation of fees for for the arbitration center and for the arbitrators and the uh, administrative fees and the procedure itself. So then you come to know and to have the knowledge for that particular matter. So there, there is nothing, everybody doing it now or those doing it for 50 years, they've been beginning at a certain point. And uh, 
You may be doing after five years and being having experience, but the way, again, in arbitration is the same as uh, for other law firm. Usually they, they call the arbitrator, they know there is experience, there is a panel. If you have been practicing, they will be asking you your profile to check if you have a certain number of cases. It's like if you have to go to the hospital and you have a special surgery and there is uh, somebody who is explaining that he has been, it's the first case, the first surgery he's doing and it's you, you may not be comfortable to do that. But if he is a co a doctor with another one who is experienced, you will be feeling comfortable to have both of them for you, not only one. So there is, we have to inspire trust as lawyers, as arbitrator or counsel in arbitration proceeding, even in law firm. You go to the law firm that is inspiring you trust that you think can provide you a solution to your matter. If you being arrested, you'll be calling the lawyer who is capable and available. Because if he's coming after one month, he say, I'm, I'm outside, I'm in Bahamas, I'm in uh, Miami. It will take him two days to come. So can you call him if you are you're being arrested on a Friday and you may stay in for the weekend or for one month? So that is the solution. Capability, trust, and availability. Wow, thank you. Uh, Fiona, you, 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 you talked of something which you call value proposition. That's what you called it. You need to start hammering the wall. You can share a value proposition. Nora Nachi, they had a question, almost a similar question. What would you advise sending proposals to prospective clients? Or does it, does it bring in clients? I think some more highlight as we enter our last minutes, because I want to hit a nail at uh, Nelson in the last minutes. Please, Fiona, the value proposition, some more light. Because you see, we practice in an, in an environment where you don't have to tout. Yes, true. Yes, there is room for the unsolicited proposals. Absolutely. Um, but make sure that what you're putting on paper as your proposition to them is certainly going to be relevant to the target, to the person that you're asking to see you and to give you a chance. So value proposition would be, for instance, saying to um, a company that's engaged in um, FinTech services, that you completely understand the FinTech space, um, that you have other FinTech clients and you've gotten a good grasp of what their needs typically are. You understand the regulation, the challenges there, the gray spaces, you understand the laws applicable, the, you know, the, the, the process for licensing, you have the right network in terms of the regulators in that space that they will, you would, you would, you know, um, get your applications, you know, um, evaluated in time, you'd look at their paperwork and help them see where the gaps are and therefore where they can beef up so that the application is a bit more um, credit worthy. So value proposition is all of that. But then on top of that, it's just showcasing what other skills you have that could help them. So other topical issues away from that focus of their business, which could be FinTech, but also you tell them, you see now there's all this data protection, privacy issues. Um, you can come in and give them training on that on basically how they need to be handling. Exactly, are they a collector? Are they a data processor? Are they a controller? Where do they fall? You'll come and give them training. You could give them training on employment issues, on wills, on real estate. I don't know, we've done trainings like for banks on things that are so not bank related, but rather are quite relevant to their customers. So by giving value add to their customers on a Saturday, telling them about, mm, let's see, wills, estate planning, those customers feel that in addition to this bank, giving them good banking service, they also get this spin-off um, side um, benefits where their lawyers can actually come in to tell them free of charge on a Saturday afternoon about how to just structure their, their estate, what a trust is, how to structure that in terms of your assets. 
Um, so value proposition both targets the actual core service that that client renders. Um, and you're talking about what you could add to them to make them look better to their clients. But away from the core service, also the other services, other like complementary, uh, either training or just um, giving them legal alerts when there's a change in law that could impact them. So there's 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 all manner of you know value add on the side that that um, when they think about Marx advocates, they're thinking yeah there's legal, all of the legal and but there's also just the human element of I'll just do my CSR, my corporate social responsibility by giving back to you this way, supporting your your clientele this way, not even just you, the bank, but your your people, your clients. Yeah, so value propositions, yeah, quite wide. Well, thank you. I think uh, we shall need to discuss that if we can have a webinar, because it's a disturbing area. Uh, from that aspect, Nelson, in one of your in one of the podcasts I've listened to, you have talked about uh, about the big cuts giving back to the young advocates because you see in this in this in this uh, in this podcast I think you said you talk of something like patience and growing vision. We shouldn't expect everything to come overnight. Does Ashitiva as a law firm, have you made it policy or in a way, do you give back to, do you refer clients to young advocates in your line of work? I'll tell you, I've personally received, I've received four clients from Kenya. Surprisingly, one client was referred by Brenda. Brenda is a member of the East African Law Society, but the three have been anonymous. Someone texts me a message, Philip, I need, I have a client who wants to register a company in Uganda. Can you please do that for me? You check, you know, share no common WhatsApp group. You've never heard of the name, but a client has come in. I believe part of the magic is in the rhetorics. Brand yourself, do this and all that, because at least I've practiced that magic. And I know it works. Nelson, do you think or do you believe in the aspect of big firms giving back. This question will also go to Fiona. I've, uh, in one, it was one of the M and A last year. One of the M and A workshops at uh, at uh, at Peak Resort Monyonyo that you attended. Uh, I happen I happen to have a session with uh, with uh, Matov Alex of Signa, uh, and in a, in his advice, he was telling me, Philip, do not do not create war with big firms. They are good people. He told me, since I started practice, I have received referrals from all these big law firms. And he told me, he did it. I think he did it strategically. He told me now, you watch me here. I'm targeting Fiona. Before I knew it, he moved his seat closer to Fiona, where Fiona was seated. Now, I need to know, and members out there need to know, how do we tap into your excess clientele? You know, um, 10 years ago, um, a, a, a brief of $500 um, would be, would excite me a lot. And, um, and, and, and yet today that is not our entry point for any of the departments, our entry price point for any of the departments. Yet I still have my friends and family who's, who can only afford that price point. And so I have in my network, um, a, a group of young lawyers who I know are good in different areas. And um, I always tell um, my family and friends at times, so as a firm, we try and avoid to a very, very, for us to take a pro bono case, it must have been agreed by the partners, but we support legal aid programs. And so in some cases, I actually take on, I, I, I pay for my, my friends and family so that then they can be, <coughs> they can be served. 
by younger colleagues who are where I was 10 years ago. So um, it gives me great joy. And, um, and not just because of the price point, at times because of the expertise. Um, just yesterday, I referred two tax matters to a younger lawyer who I know is a far better tax expert than myself or than any of my colleagues here. And, and, and so um, that's why I said it's good to have a good relationship with seniors. It's good to have a good relationship with your peers. Um, I refer work to my, my classmates all the time. Um, I refer work to um, senior colleagues, to leaders in court many times. So um, this ecosystem, you know, requires that um, you, you increase your catchment for work when you have more friends within the profession. Um, and even if the friend does not give you work, uh, perhaps the relative will come and ask them, is Philip a good lawyer in this area? And their opinion, if you want to know a good doctor, you ask the other doctor, you ask, you ask another doctor about them. So it gives me great joy, Philip, to see that, um, you know, younger colleagues where we can um, refer work to them, we do. Wow. Wonderful. Fiona, is it true yes. that big law firms have bring first work? Is it true you have Not bring true. first <laughs> <laughs> not true, not true, not true at all. And you know what? There is so much pie to go around um, that even the big law firms cannot swallow it all up alone. Um, mm -hmm. Because then you risk giving a poor quality service because you're taking on so much. So you've, you've bitten off so much and you really can't chew it down well. So it's okay sometimes to actually, a lot of the time the referrals would be a case of you're conflicted. And even if you tried so much to convince the client that you know what, we're so big, there is a way we can create these walls called Chinese walls, such that a whole different team within, for instance, let's see, a mergers and acquisitions practice. Um, we've got maybe four partners that handle mergers and acquisitions. So if Fiona is going to be conflicted because she's the one acting on the one side already, um, we can give you another partner. No, ring fencing like that. Wow. Some, some law firms, particularly um, in larger practices, um, can do this. Um, but sometimes it's really hard in a smaller practice, and especially in our markets where, um, suppose, you know, being, we're, we're mostly under 50. Um, so many times it's okay to say, look, we're, we're conflicted, just be ethical about it and, and hand it over to somebody else. Um, other times it's a case of you don't think you might do it justice at that particular point in time. Um, yeah. Somebody else might do better. Now, when you think about who to give it to, you're going to give it somebody you trust, you absolutely know will not let you down. That the client came to you, it's your reputation. Um, when you're giving it, you absolutely need to be sure of the person you're giving it to. So to the young lawyers, it's really about standing out and sort of carving out a space for yourself where you're known and you deliver. You, you, you really, you know, when you're given something in your hands, you run with it to the end. You don't sort of create, create these gaps for, 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 for that delivery, but to fall through a cracks. So it's about being reliable, having a reputation in the market. And this comes with time. Um, so yes, do we give away? We do, we do share. Um, in other instances, we've said, look, this is so big. Can we do it together? So big. Can, can, we, can we pull you, you, it's an elephant. Can you start from the trunk? We will start at the tail end or the hind legs. Together we'll do it justice. That's also been done. Um, two, three law firms pull together because it's a massive, massive, in terms of deploying resources, you don't want the other clients to pull out their hair and cry that you're just unavailable. Um, um, so, and yet you've got the skill set. Um, but yes, in terms of giving back, we do um, away from mentorship, away from referrals. Um, we do, you know, the sponsorships for events. We come and speak at events. Um, we try as much as possible to give back. We have a very deliberate CSR um, practice. We have pro bono 
um, and we will literally roll up sleeves and just come and really participate with you um, on a cause that's really important for you as a client. Um, in terms of uh, mentorship, we you know have an award for like a student maybe at uh, LDC. We're trying to get one for like at the university. All of this is really a way from building you know visibility with the young lawyers. It's also to give you a platform um, that merit really counts. Um, let's 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 just move away from I don't know knowing who I don't know so and so. So how will I ever go ahead? No. We try and level that platform and, and and give a leg up where we can. So it's about just uh, you know distinguishing yourself, get seen, you will be picked up for sure. Yeah, knocking on the door, not being afraid, dropping that email. Like like I said earlier, again, digital revolution. It's so easy to access people today. It's so easy to get on to, to get online um, and get an email of a person you're looking for or to get somebody that will get you somebody, but to, to, to make your proposition without even being there physically. Um, so Julian. yeah. Thank you, Fiona. Julian, uh, the three of you are top-ranked advocates, uh, Chambers Global, IFL, IFLR, so many top, ranked advocates uh julian you 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 i don't know if it's a network global global legal insights please share with us slightly different from referring work please share with us how best can someone place themselves for chambers global to look out for them Uh, as far as I know, they usually consider a uh, commercial matter, business law. So that's, you have to be specialized in that field. And usually the kind of transaction you're working on has a value. So if you had the chance to work on a merger of, uh, of a bank, it will be allowing you to, be, to have the reference. They will be talking to the bank, to the other council who has been working on that transaction. And if you come up that you have been uh, working on that, it's, it's an added value. If you have been working on the euro bonds, if you have been working on an oil and gas transaction between two big companies or a, trans a concession agreement between the government with a particular investor, then it will be highlighting you as uh, one among the, the top lawyer in that jurisdiction. So as Fiona was saying about Nelson, it's the go-to law firm is to be trustable and reliable. If you have already done this, I can trust as an investor going in a jurisdiction where I don't know nobody that you can do that. It's like when you visit a jurisdiction you don't know and there is a well-branded hotels, there is a Mario, there is a Radisson. The first day at least you may decide, okay, I spend the first night in that one because I know the standard. So putting in place standards that are reliable a brand that is already there and uh, well known give you give to the investor the trust the confidence that they can uh, work with you they can come to you and try to to give you work because they will not be spending time to explain what they need they have the expectation that you already know what they need and that you can deliver so that is usually the good thing of being ref having that reference is not enough but it's helpful yes so having uh, being part of uh, the network like ALN is also allowing to have that standard saying, okay, we have standard among that network. So if you're part of that one, we assume that the minimum is there, that the, the, the standard we need, the expectation is we'll be, we'll be having the answer and the response we need. Oh, thank you. Uh, we seem to be running out of time. I needed to at least get a question or two from participants, but I don't seem to see hands raised. Our plan time was two to four, but it never gets ending. More so when people are enjoying and uh, learning. Someone has said this has been one of the best webinars he has attended. 
it has been an experience of, uh, we have heard from an experience of over 55 years. Uh, to the members listening in, all the ELS webinars are shared, recorded and shared on the ELS uh, YouTube channel. Uh, thank you, my panelists. I have learned a lot. I know people have learned a lot. I have shared a few links to the ELS website. Uh, members of the ELS society, there is a specialized arbitration course that has been organized. It's at $400. I plan to attend that. Uh, you become an associate member. Then it's after that that you can choose to continue. Uh, thank you very much. Please follow, look out for these people, follow them. I have followed Fiona since I was, I think at in fourth year, I read her articles every other day. I'm not that uh, old. You're not that old, sure. <laughs> It's not so long, it's not so long, but at least for the years, I know the I read your first article, so I know. Uh, Nelson, he has very good podcasts, very nice podcasts. Google his name. Julien, he will be speaking to the young arbitrators. I always want to learn more from you. I always want to learn more from people that are above us. Please thank you very much to the membership of over 300 members. I think this is also one of the most attended webinars. Uh, thank you, please. Uh, I'll, I'll beg that we leave at leisure. You leave as and when we wish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Brenda thank you. and David. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you.